Uh, firstly, it was very, very um, overwhelming to be given the opportunity to do this. Prior to going, I really had a sense that it was an important thing for South Africa to contribute to. It was also very difficult for me at this particular historical moment to leave South Africa, to leave my student and worker comrades. I've received very little news because we've been out of um, communication about the terrible struggle that's been happening, the very violent struggle that's been happening at universities. So to start by saying it was a difficult um, decision to go and leave our struggles, but it is true that we have had a kind of reset in 1994. We have a huge responsibility to take ourselves in a different direction. It's very clear speaking to um, other activists who've been part of the struggle to free Palestine, that this is a struggle that's been going on for 70 years. They haven't had a reset. It is like going back in time um, when, you, when you engage with the Israeli state, which I can speak to a little bit later. But I just want to draw to attention that even as struggles are difficult in South Africa at the moment, we did have a, a momentary reset. And it might not have been the best thing, and it's certainly not the only thing. We have a long way to go. But the people of Palestine and the people um, who continue to defend brutally uh, the idea of Israel have not had a reset. They're in this struggle for 70 years. So the, the, the discussions, the debates, the fighting is so much worse than what we are doing over here. So I just want to start by saying, by acknowledging our situation in relation to theirs. Um, I, I want to thank everyone who worked actually for a year. In some ways, I had the easy part. I, I left here two weeks ago, um, but there are many, many, mainly women, not only, but mainly women who raised funds uh, through <coughs> From what I understand from the WhatsApp group that was very busy, almost as busy as the FISMAS full WhatsApp groups, it really was a long, hard slog to raise money, to be part of a solidarity campaign, and that was done largely through people, individuals, showing solidarity, understanding from afar that the situation in Israel-Palestine and the situation of occupied Palestine and occupied West Bank cannot continue. It is 2016, and we really need to figure out Flotillas are fantastic, but we also need to figure out more forms of solidarity because it cannot be that that situation uh, persists in the way that it, it, it exists. So firstly, thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes, who are in fact more important. Um, I've managed to meet some of you, not all of you. I hope I'll meet the rest of you um, now that I'm back. Um, also to just acknowledge the 13 other women who were on the Zaytuna and then the many more who actually didn't get to go, which in itself was a terrible situation uh, for reasons un, um, unknown to all of us. Uh, specifically, two boats were not able to sail. So we started out with two boats. Um, the Amal didn't leave Barcelona for technical reasons. And that meant that a group of 25 women had to be cut down to a group of 13, which was a very hard thing to do because many people had prepared themselves mentally, emotionally, physically, to go on that journey. Um, fortunately, through the, the international solidarity, another boat was purchased. And by the time it got to Messina, where I joined the mission, um, there were again two boats potentially leaving um, for Gaza. And within 24 hours, it became apparent again that the second ship was not going to, for various reasons, be able to sail. And again, we had a situation where people needed to choose who would go. Um, so I want to acknowledge all those women who took time out and were going to go and didn't get a chance to go. Um, they would have gone home, hopefully inspired to come back and do it again or to continue from afar. And then the 13 women who were on the, the uh, Zaytuna, of those 13 women, there were three crew, um, a captain uh, from Australia who's been on very many Greenpeace actions. Um, she's a very strong woman, and that is why she's able to be an all-vessel captain. It meant that we had a tight ship that was quite um, challenging for a lot of us, but it was very necessary that we had someone who was both uh, very skilled in, in sailing, but also had understood how to be arrested, how to, I mean, she's done some crazy things like throw people in shipping nets so that the people who are whaling 
or who are fishing decide either to continue fishing or to save the people in the nets. So she was very much prepared to do what, um, what needed to happen. And then we had two fairly young, the only the two people younger than me on the ship were a sailor woman who, um, who helped um, make sure that we survived the little squall, which I can tell you about later, but some harsh conditions uh, on the sea. And then we had two Al Jazeera journalists who um, managed to report live, I don't know how many of you saw, and also managed to do package sends every day, trying to get as much of the message out from the boat as possible. Um, and they did a fantastic job as well. Um, in very trying conditions, wobbly boats and big waves and wind. So if they are listening um, to, to say a big shout out to them, we didn't get to say goodbye to them because when we, were, when we uh, got onto land, uh, their mission was pretty much over because all their cameras were taken. So they left that evening and we didn't see them again. We didn't get to say goodbye. So hopefully they hear this. Um, and then of the seven participants, um, I would like to say especially to the Malaysian delegate and the Algerian delegate who both do not have consular representation in Israel, they went there knowing that there wasn't going to be any government help um, or if, they, if the government wanted, their governments wanted to help the Israelis would not allow that. <coughs> they were also the two women who, who wear hijabs and who are very easily identifiable as Muslim. and. Um, they surely understand that what that meant. I understood better what that meant once we were in Israeli um, captivity, I suppose. Um, so I want to um, say really hats off to them because they put themselves in a, in a hell of a situation. And then um, two other delegates who were 72 and 74, that they managed to be on that boat, um, the Nobel laureate from um, from Ireland got very, very sick, but she was very clear that she was going to be on that boat and that she was going to take her message of solidarity and peace and hope uh, to Gaza and had been, in fact, four times prior, has been deported four times from Israel. In one of the detention centers that we were at just before we left, we were lying on the back of a, on the bottom of a double bunk and there was her name from 2009 <laughs> with a whole lot of other names. So we were, I was very fortunate to be amongst um, really brave and amazing women. Um, we also had a, um, a Maori parliamentarian from New Zealand. Um, it is, it's quite uh, heartwarming to hear how the indigenous people of um, the Maori indigenous and other people from that area have been regrouping in ways that felt very similar to the decolonized conversations that I've been having with um, student comrades. Um, so it was really good to be in conversation with people from around the world who are strangely <coughs> enough fighting over similar things, fighting over land, fighting over justice, fighting over the fact that indigenous people continue to be brutalized, not only here, but in a, a number of places around the world. Um, also, the American, our team, our boat leader is a, was a lieutenant in the American um, military. She's 70 plus years old, Mary Ann Wright. She's also been on a number of missions. Um, she has worked in the military and I think stopped around the Iraqi war. And so I spent a lot of time going around the world, North, South Korea, you name it, wherever there is violence, uh, she has been going and taking the message of dialogue and peace, um, which was important to be around for me, especially in this moment where in South Africa, it seems that um, we are sitting on the cusp of hopefully falling in a number of directions and not simply returning to one where the powerful continue to use the state machinery to repress dissent. So there were a number of amazing women on that boat. The journey itself was, um, I think an exercise in solidarity. I think we really need to reach out um, more consistently with the technology we have to have conversations and learn from people in different parts of the world because we're not going through things on our own. There are many, many people who are struggling. Um, we managed to speak to Gaza via satellite phone a couple of times. Oh, I must also um, mention that um, Dr. Fozio, who's from Malaysia, 
medical doctor, um, when she was telling us her um, experience and her struggle and solidarity with the people of occupied Palestine, she has started three hospitals and runs um, various programs to make sure that the, all the operations that take 120 days, they are waiting, crazy waiting lists in Gaza. I mean, we, we don't even need to go over the facts. We know how bad it is there, but that this uh, doctor from Malaysia on this boat spends a lot of her time Besides delivering babies and in her private practice, she has started a number of NGOs. She could um, phone officers in Gaza and speak to people because she is that, her solidarity is that rooted in the place. So there were different kinds of people bringing different kinds of messages and support and solidarity um, to the people of Gaza. So, I mean, I really have a lot to say about this, but I don't want to bore everybody. Um, I'll speak just a little bit about um, for me, it was uh, personally important to go on this mission. Um, everyone kept asking, wh why, where do you connect to Palestine? Why do you connect uh, to the struggle so strongly? And of course, as many of you could have also answered, uh, apartheid is something we know well here. And um, Israeli apartheid is it's kind of taken from the handbook in some ways. There are so many similarities. and. I think probably the key difference, besides the religious element, which adds to the, the struggle, is that we are in 2016 and military technology, technology has, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically apartheid on speed um, in the sense that the, the possibility to be brutal is amplified so much because of the amount of money and power and military technology that exists over there. But then having been there, I've never been to Israel before, having been there for, I don't even know how many hours it was because we were woken up and put to sleep so many times that I don't, I can't, maybe 36 hours that we were actually on land. It became very apparent that even though technology helps to suppress people and oppress people, the very basic ways that one dehumanizes someone is the ways that happened to us under apartheid. It's, it's about, um, insisting that people believe that they are different from one another, that some people are more superior than others, that some people have more choice. Sometimes that's just by luck, being born <laughs> a couple of kilometers on the wrong side of the fence, which many of you will know. Um, so the dehumanization is not, it's amplified by technology, but it's the same system. It's the system of forcing people to expose themselves both physically by doing strip searches um, and by de dehumanizing you um, in ways that don't require lots of money. Um, we all know the past system is very much alive there. The thing that was confusing for me was that the oppressor looks like the oppressed. I, I was very confused by that because in South Africa, it was very clear who the oppressor was and who the oppressed were. And over there, that's not true. You can't see who's who, except if people are wearing scarves and hijabs. So the dehumanizing practice is in fact very simple. It's a case of locking people up stopping your movement, questioning you and cross-questioning you as if you are a terrorist or as if you come with ill intent, even when you say very clearly that that is not the case, that this is a peaceful boat with women and that we, all we're doing is taking a message of solidarity to a devastated place. Even when you do that, when you are on the wrong side of this, you are the enemy. And I just kept reminding myself, and let me say up front, if you saw the images that the IDF would have put out, it would have been the images and the story that they want you to see. And to be honest with you, what we went through was 1% of what Palestinians go through. We were treated very well. And that was primarily because we were clear that we were going peacefully. We also had media attention and 
with those two um, uh, lines of communication, really, one to the world and one to the people who are holding the guns, they, they can afford you a little bit of humanity because you are not challenging them at all. And so it makes complete sense to me that they would have behaved the way they did towards us because it would have been a very bad um, decision of theirs to do anything else. It would have been terrible if they had behaved like they did to the Turkish ship, where they literally shot from helicopters with live ammunition and then went on board and executed people. So this is a, um, it's a, it's a conflict and a space that has technology that really confuses people. So if you would have seen the images, you would have seen the Navy personnel boarding our ship. I don't even know how many things people saw. I don't know what. Everyone has a GoPro. So they have their story from every angle, and they can edit it exactly the way they want to. The minute they boarded our, well, before we saw the naval ships on the horizon, our satellites were cut. We could send no more messages, no more images about what we were feeling about what was going on. So this te technological warfare around who communicates what the story is, is a, uh, I mean, it's one that, m the David and Goliath story is not, it doesn't even capture it. So we were treated much, much better um, than any Palestinian or even Jewish person who would have said, we're coming not necessarily in peace. We're not going to let you stop us. We're going to go forward. Those people would have received much harsher treatment than us. Um, and then just very briefly, the, I think the, the, this, when we got to 32 miles out, they'd been watching us all along. There's no doubt about that. Um, I can speak another time about some of the other stuff on the boat, which is really important. But when they decided that we were no longer going to be talking to the rest of you and they were going to come and stop us, I mean, four huge military ships on the horizon and um, the radio communication, which we hoped to record, but we, we couldn't because they took everything. We, um, we the cap through the captain, they try, we tried to have the conversation with them and say, so everyone who says dialogue works, Dialogue works for the people who own the guns, man. We tried and we said to them, we don't have guns. You can come aboard and search us. We have nothing. We don't even have food or money to take. It's not a humanitarian um, boat. All we're doing is going to take hope to a devastated place. Surely you cannot argue against taking hope to a devastated place. They were like, in terms of the law, we all know the apartheid law. Law gives you the right to do some fucking crazy things. In terms of the apartheid law, we will not allow you to break this blockade. We like, we one ship, 15 meters long, 13 women. We've told you everything. You've seen it on the news. You know who we are. Why would you stop us from taking a message of hope to a devastated place? Our orders are to do this. We will board you. I mean, at first, before they were talking about boarding us, they were using very... Um, broad language about we will have to use force against you. And when you're sitting in a little boat and you see these military things, you wonder if that's not just a tornado, all your communications are off. You don't actually know what they mean, and you do know that when they say they will use force, they have used uh, deadly force in the past. Uh, fortunately, that wasn't our case, and I think that had a lot to do with all of you at home watching. Uh, they understood that that was um, happening. And so we had, the, we had these young kids, 20-year-olds, board us with these... This, these Robocop equipments that we see our own riot police in, it's devastating for them that these young kids, that's what they go into. They come onto that ship and they're scared of us. They think we're going to hurt them. They don't know how to respond. Mm -hmm. And so we respond in a way where we try to, and it's conflictual for me because I understand that going and saying, please listen to us, please let us do, it doesn't work with the people who own the guns and have the power. So there's a part of me that feels like we, we failed because we didn't reach Gaza and people were waiting. I don't even know about this other bombing stuff. I'm hoping that's not in the last few days. I mean, it's on the same day, yes, at the same moment as your boat on. was being intercepted. Uh, yeah. While the women were standing 
on the shores waiting for you, waving their flags. See, I don't even know all of this yet. And the thing is, those kids on that boat, we had seven hours with them, because that's how long it takes to get anywhere on an old boat that only goes, f whatever, six miles an hour. Um, and when we were on the boat, one of the things we did do, um, one of the crew members is a music teacher, and she had a guitar with her. And so she, uh, in conversation with the rest of us, um, wrote a song about what we were doing. And um, after a couple of hours, I mean, the first thing was when they came on board, they brought uh, picnic bags, because that's apparently what they do with missions that have um, media. And they put the picnic bags down and started unpacking and saying, are you hungry? Uh, some started with water and then started with falafel and other things. Not falafel, um, the bread. Um, and, you know, in that moment, I said to the, we were told that we shouldn't speak because if you antagonize them, even in a little way, and you scare them, they will become violent towards you, and that we need to speak through our boat leader and our captain, which was very hard for all of us, obviously, because um, we were all, uh, we were all active women who wanted to say something, but we'd agreed that that wouldn't happen. But in that initial moment where it was very clear once they boarded our boat, they kept their Zodiac, it's called Zodiacs, these kind of Star Wars looking boats that can move very quickly, that have guns and lasers and about 18 people on board. About eight of them got on board, not about eight of them got on board, four women and four men. I mean, the average age was 21, I think, of the people, part two senior people. And the, the Zodiac stayed next to us, taking pictures and video of whatever interaction happened where somebody smiled or someone looked relaxed because that was the story that they wanted to tell. It was extremely hard for me at that moment, being someone who supports BDS very strongly to see one or two of, I was actually the crew or not necessarily activists, happily take the chocolate mousse and start eating it and be photographed. It was a really hard moment because that was a moment that we hadn't discussed. And um, I basically, said to her, listen, I don't eat Israeli products at home. I'm not about to start eating it here. <laughs> and, um, and then, I mean, it was pretty clear. They, they worked out pretty quickly who the ones were that they, sorry, who, who the, oh my goodness, sorry guys. <laughs> Can you hear me at the back without this thing? Okay, if I cry again, I'll do this because I know my voice gets softer. Okay, um, so, there was a it was a really hard moment to see how when you when you are occupied as we were in our boat for a few hours, your choice is gone. And I mean, when when the hand that feeds you is the hand that moves you as well, it's a really it's a messed up situation. So we had seven hours on the boat with these young people, who were behaving who were treating us fairly well. Um, but as we knew, I mean, the Malaysian um, delegate, Dr. Fauzia and Samira from Algeria, these were people, the, the Spanish delegate were clear they weren't going to eat the, because they are um, supporters of BDS. But other people also, that's not their form of solidarity. So it was hard to be a unit and then recognize that actually many of us disagree on some things. Um, I'll just share two more moments from the boat with you guys. Um, the one was, at some point we were getting really tired, it was dark and we wanted to sing. And uh, there were one or two songs that the ship knew and then we had been practicing and you can go and see it on YouTube. I think two or three of the women sang it and recorded it and it's uploaded. It's a beautiful song about 13 of us getting on Zaytuna, trying to go to Gaza with a message of hope and saying that we will keep coming back and we won't be silent until the people of occupied Palestine are free. And so what we said was, let's 
play some music and let's first sing one or two songs and then let's get to the Palestinian song or the song that we'd written. And we were singing and then we sang the Palestinian song and of course the, even as we were allowed to move around the boat we just had to ask someone to go with us. There were a few people, who, uh, IDF soldiers who were close by and um, they pretty much heard what we, was, what we were singing, didn't say anything. And there was one uh, soldier who we later found out her grandparents are from Morocco. And one of the Al Jazeera journalists is a Moroccan living in the UK. The, and they, were, they were, had a conversation. And um, another one, one of the guys, also a young guy who loves music apparently, suggested that we sing a song together. And a lot of people will go, oh, that's so kitsch, like sitting on a boat, singing a song with these soldiers who are actually, you know, acting on behalf of a illegitimate barbaric government. Uh, but we couldn't figure out a song to sing together. Um, and he suggested we, that we sing Hallelujah. And strangely enough, everyone on the boat knew that song, even the Muslim um, comrades. And we sang the song and it was a confusing and I mean beautiful human moment with the way these young people were singing with us. They didn't want to be there, some of them necessarily raising us. A lot of them don't want to be in the army, they don't have a choice. It was very clear that the one woman, she's the only one who, who took food, uh, we had our own food as well, she's the only one who took a cup of tea from, from us. So it's a, it's a devastating situation on both sides. Of course, you can't, we can't count up because we know where the power lies. And that's very, very clear. And that's not the point I'm making. But that was a moment that was really confusing. And I think maybe important for one or two of those soldiers to feel like they could be something else. They could do something else. The second one, which was the hardest moment of the entire trip for me, when we were getting closer to Ashtar, uh, because it was dark, you could see the lights. And um, some of the women who'd been on flotillas before, the ones that had actually made it in 2008, I think, and then 2009, we all stood up and they were pointing out to us, um, we wanted to know where is Gaza. And it's very clear where Gaza is because you see the lights and then you see nothing. You see a dumb haze from, I suppose, generators, I don't know. But you just see this dark area, and for about, I think it must have been about 20 minutes, uh, we just, I don't know, st stood and looked at the, <coughs> the black destination that we were trying to get to. And we sang for as long as we could. Um, but in, in, in that moment, it was clear that we had failed. Um, which was, I mean, to hear that, that the women were bombed while the IDF was taking images of us eating, some of us eating, and being ushered was, I think that moment will stay with me. Um, uh, did I think I would die? Um, unfortunately, my upbringing has been one where my father was very involved as a teacher in the anti-apartheid movement, so from a young age we had police, apartheid police coming into our home. I've seen my dad arrested, whatever, so I'm fairly paranoid in some ways uh, because of that upbringing. I always think about the worst case scenario, and so I definitely considered the worst case scenario because I think it's a good way to plan for difficult situations. It may be not, be, it may be not good for my blood pressure and other things, but certainly I, I did Imagine that that was a possibility. Before we left Messina, um, the Turkish delegate who wasn't on the boat, her husband was killed on the Ma Mavimara in her arms. She was on the ship when it happened. And so she shared a lot of that with us. So we didn't go in there um, expecting that that would happen, but certainly we did go knowing that it was a possibility, even if it, in this instance, because of the high profile people on board, it was unlikely. Um, that they would do something like that, but certainly it was there. I also thought I was going to die from the storm. I'd never been on a boat before, 
And we had a situation, we had three situations, in fact, that I, I think I had my first anxiety attack on the boat the night that the, we had a mini squall and one of the rigging things broke. And so the first thing was we turning around in the middle of a storm. And then after the captain saw what the damage was, he said, okay, now we're gonna go ahead again. So we turned around in the storm and then we turned back again because we really didn't want to turn around. So we, we sailed for three days with bad equipment. Um, so there were a number of times that I thought potentially, but that has something to do with my worst case scenario planning. In terms of prison, what I can say is my partner works on South African prisons, and so I've been in a few of them, um, visiting people, family, whatever. Uh, the prison that we were in, I'm unsure that that's the given prison. I'm unsure that that's the state of all prisons, but in relation to South African prisons, it's a really uh, better place. Uh, you have rooms of six with six bunk beds, a toilet and a shower in each room, even as it's very basic. Whereas in South Africa, a waiting trial and other places, you have overcrowding, you have communal toilets and things. So I was thinking about that, even as this was a difficult experience in relation to South Africa. I mean, the prisons are better. But that also made me understand a bit more as you saw the security apparatus operate. They spend a lot of money and time investing in those kinds of things because that's the language and the currency that they work in. So yes, it's a bit better in terms of the facilities, but the, ch the checkpoints and the moments of stopping and potentially ending up in jail are, I think, really, really high and not for what we would consider criminal, regular criminal activity. So on the whole, the prison, I was quite surprised that it was in decent shape and that you could actually be six in a cell with a blanket, a new blanket, a pillow. Now, who knows if that was for us, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. But in terms of South African prisons that are currently overcrowded and problematic, it seemed a bit better. Um, uh, the people that dealt with us, it's like the South African situation or any other one, it depends on who you get. Yeah. What I've understood is that Israelis come from different uh, places. These are Jewish people who come to Israel from different places, and when they are there, they experience racism and various things even there. So there is the Israel-Palestine issue, but internal to Israel, there's also discrimination and racism and all of that, and you get the sense of that by the people who, <coughs> in some instances, the people who have been discriminated against are harder, as we know, because that's a response, and then some other people who understand or not, and are quite generous. So it's, it's a bit of both of those things. Another trip in solidarity, I would definitely be up for going on another trip, but I also do think that other people need to take that journey because there's a lot of lessons in that journey, and I don't necessarily need to go again, although I would make myself available to go. I think it's really important that people go there and see what's happening. Um, in terms of in South Africa, I think we really need to continue with BDS. It's a really important move. I think it's really important. I think the South African government issued warrants of arrest against the military people who attacked the Turkish boat in 2010. That's really good. I think we need to put more pressure as South Africans. I also think, I mean, the, the, my ambassador was one of the only ones who didn't make it to me. And that says something about how they treat him over there. The US was there. Spain was there, New Zealand was there, Australia was there, everyone was there, but my ambassador didn't come. And only did I find out halfway in the air when he came to find me that actually they'd been trying um, to get to me, but they'd been given the runaround. And that's because South Africa has a particular stance against Israel. And even if we want to push them further, which we should, they have a stance. The Algerian government has a stance. So every time the um, Samira, the Algerian, came into a place, every person, police, military, navy, whoever it was, were like, oh, Algeria. Because they know Algeria won't even send a, an ambassador there. So we must push our people to be brave there and keep pushing them because it's, it's illegal for them to not have given our ambassador and me the right to my council. I was there for 36 hours and they didn't let him come and that's a problem. What is also a problem is they never gave us our phone call. I never got to phone my partner or my lawyer 
And that is illegal. They kept telling us they will let us do it, and they just never did. They didn't want us to be able to say anything to the world. So um, solidarity in South Africa must happen, and we must think of creative ways. And BDFS is important, and we need to speak to more people because people actually don't know what's going on there. If they knew, they would support uh, more <coughs> vociferously, like people did when we boycotted apartheid. We need that international solidarity. Um, did we think at any point we were going to make a Terran? Yes. We thought, I mean, when the miles started going, we thought 100 miles they're going to come and get us. So we were counting 95, 90, and miles take a long time in a slow boat because it's nautical miles, not miles per hour. So we were counting, and we really thought we were going to make it until, you know, we started seeing that our nothing was working, and we saw these military ships come, and then we knew very clearly if they put out four big ships for you, for a small boat of 13 women, they want you to know for sure that there's no way you're getting past them. So they could have sent just one Zodiac and they would have been able to outrun us, do anything. That, that's not what they did. They came with the biggest muscle they could uh, to also give a point, to say that, look, we are strong and we can do this thing. I think often um, we understand resistance in a particular way, and that's often very uh, masculine. Um, not only violent resistance, protests, sit-ins. We often see the, the, the person who's uh, doing that as a man. And um, it, I think it was really important that a woman's boat go on its own. Um, I can say that in our preparation, um, there were very over-eager male comrades yeah. who at moments had to be reminded that they were very capable women who were running this thing and that they didn't need as much. It. So the, the, the question of patriarchy and the women's role is everywhere. It, di it didn't magically go away because we were a woman's boat. So we had to still stand up and say, this is not appropriate. You know, we know what we're doing. Let the woman speak. You're taking up too much time. That's on the one hand, there's that. Um, on the other hand, it was quite interesting to see that the IDF, I don't know if they I mean, if everyone has to do military service, then it means that half of the people who are in the, um, the military, the Navy and whatever, are women. Um, and I wonder what that does, because historically that's the people who are policemen and whatever who are enacting violence on people are often men. And that must do something to men. So I wonder what it does to women when they are in a similar situation, given a similar kind of power over people, whether that means they start acting more in a patriarchal way or not, I don't know, but it's a question that came up for me. And in terms of lessons learned in that regard, it seems to me we have too many men heading governments, heading military <laughs> or defense forces, and it's, it's, be, it's become very clear to me that we need a different way, and that's why the, the Fees Must Fall and the student movement for me give a huge amount of hope, um, because there we see women and queer people and people other than simple heteronormative men saying that we're not going to stand back anymore. And I think that, that that is something we really have to support. If we want a different kind of change, we need different actors, hopefully, who can act differently, even in structural conditions that obviously influence how people act. But I've l this, I mean, it's n not only um, is it the case that resistance is living every day? And I think that's what Palestinian women do, that we don't hear. They live and they, they continue to support family and feed and grow under the most impossible conditions. So there's definitely that everyday resistance that even under apartheid we didn't acknowledge very well with what women were doing uh, in the anti-apartheid movement. So we need to focus on that more. We need to amplify women and queer people's voices we need to figure out how to tell the men with all their good intentions, all their money and all their powerful guns, they don't know the answers. They've gotten us where we are, largely, because they have been the leaders and now they need to shut up and sit down. And I think that's, and hopefully they can hear that because that is said out of absolute frustration, absolute love, absolute desire to have a place that is nonviolent, that is just for the majority and not for the few in the case that we have. So I hope we can have that conversation and that, you know, our men don't run away scared. 
um, or run towards us and shut us up because they're scared. Um, in terms of uh, what the Israel, I mean, the, the Israeli military is a regime and their communication is a regime. There's no doubt about that. So while it is firstly letting things into the Gaza Strip, I mean, that place, there's, we didn't see ships for days, <laughs> not days, for hours in the day that we knew we were 100 miles. Now, I don't know if they cleared the strip so that they could have us all alone, but it certainly looked to me like there was not much going on in that area. But when you come into the Israeli port, it's like you've gone through a time warp and now you suddenly in a space that is normal and operating. And yet for kilometers before that, there is nothing. And from what people are saying, there's bombing. So I think they have a very well-oiled machine. Um, that will confuse even me because some people were kind and nobody pushed me around too much. I mean, the most, there were some dehumanizing things and it became very apparent because I was with, when you browner, you go in, you go with the Algerians. So the, the Africans were, we were, for example, when the consular people came, there was a courtyard with two benches. The consular was sitting, the legal people were there. They were sitting on these picnic benches and myself, Samira, and um, Fosia who were sitting in a little cage right there. And we said to them, now what's the difference between them and us? Why are we sitting in a cage? And they're like, no, 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 you stay there. So the point is that you, you, you learn very quickly that they know who to put a little bit more pressure on, but they do it in a way that's very sophisticated, even as it's just normal interaction. So I don't believe that they're letting in tons of goods. Um, in terms of cooperation and commitment, certainly we went and cooperated, I mean, until the moment that they got onto the boat, we were not cooperating. And there was a long back and forth between our captain with us and with whoever the, there were three different negotiators uh, from the military side. So there was a long back and forth and we said, we're keeping on going, we're not stopping. They invited us, they said, we will put you on our fast boat, we'll take you to Ashcott. We will drive your boat for you. Um, we will let you drive. Why don't you drive us? They, they tried all kinds of things to make sh to make it easier for us to to go in, uh, and we said no. That the way we're not going to cooperate is that we're going to continue to go. Um, but other than that, the mission was one of cooperation. From and that was the majority position that I joined into. I have my personal opinions, um, which in conversation with some of the very experienced pe peace activists, I had very good conversations because we sit in a situation here where there's a lot of violence on both sides. So that question of cooperation and resistance is, is it's newer year, but it's year now. So I really learned a lot having conversations with people, but I was part of a mission that was cooperative and I was part of that team for that moment. So from our side, we cooperated. From their side, they didn't give us a phone call. It's nonsense. Um, they, they had an entire, what looked like a city of Navy, military, prison, and um, what do you call these people uh, that stamp your passport? Those people. Yes. yes, they had a tent set up for us. They were processing us like clockwork, from medicals to strip searches to checking our bags, a whole sitting us down for an interview, trying to convince us to sign the deportation order. So we went through all of those things, and we were not cooperative in that sense. We didn't sign anything. But they would, from their side, probably say this was great and what happened is we accept this kind of resistance. I mean, what the success rate of putting them under pressure, I think the success comes from all of you being interested, following people around the world following, and we must build on that. Um, but kind of strategically, they had the upper hand the whole time, except for uh, exposing the fact that actually it doesn't work so well. We need, we need other things. BDS is a really important thing. We need more creative ways of putting them under pressure because they are very powerfully armed and the US has just given them multiple billion rand for the next 10 years. So that's not going to go away. Um, yeah, thank you.